<laughs> I got a little problem here. Uh, <laughs> I've grown a little fat in my time here. Hey guys, Brent Hall, Bill Show. Talking last time about Georgia Mullins, how to tell the difference, right? This is all part of that classical series and how to put rooms together. Today, we're gonna put a room together. We're gonna take Georgia Mullins, I designed for Cucan Brothers, and we're gonna put them on a wall. So let's go build some. So we're gonna do a Georgian room, right? We're gonna do a, a room that you might do on your job. Say your client asks you to do a Georgian room. What does that mean? So these are Georgian moldings that we designed for Cucan Brothers. These are in the classical molding package. What you'll see is that they, they fit nicely together. And I've actually got two scale and sizes of moldings here so that we can create hierarchy. Remember, we're gonna use this as our reference piece, right? If you, if you watch my videos on classical design and kind of how all that works, you remember that there's a proportion and scale to the moldings, okay? That there's a narrative, there's a you know feminine versus masculine nature. Remember that all the moldings that we use in the house come from this system. Base, chair rail off the pedestal, architrave, crown moldings, right? All of that works from this system. So we're gonna use that as a reference. So this is our base. Uh, if you remember the video on the history of the Georgian bases, sometimes these things get, you know, one and two inches wide. This one's not quite that wide, but you do see that it kind of lines up with the height of the, the base off the plinth and the base cap there. So this is gonna be a really nice base. Here's what we've got here, guys. We've got a little studio here where we've got a faux wall, and I'm trying to put moldings together so that you can understand how they work together, right? The proportion, the scale, the hierarchy. And we're gonna elevate some areas. You're gonna see how the crown goes in. But I've got my door. I'm gonna put a window in here. We're gonna start with the base. Then we're gonna put a chair rail in, and then we're gonna put a cornice and a crown in there. And you'll really see how this room, starting as a bedroom, right? Elevating to a very formal space, all based on the type of moldings that we put in. Ow! No, just kidding. <laughs> I've got the this door, right? And it's not a real big door, but you kind of get the idea. And I'm gonna nail this in place. Just tacking these in. I'm gonna be tearing things down and redoing this wall a number of times, so I don't want to have too many nail holes in it. Now we've got a door. Now this is the bigger casing, right? So this is the, the bigger one. It is about five and a half inches, which is pretty big, right? That's a pretty big, pretty big casing. Now I'm using that on the door because the door has more elevation where we're building it up. Now remember, if we look at our classical system and we and we think about these things being guidelines, maybe this is showing this architrave to be about five inches. And so our other casing is uh, about four and a half. And people ask me what size moldings they should be. You know what, I, I really like uh, moldings that are at least four inches, okay? So if you have nine, 10, even eight foot rooms, a good size molding is at least four inches. So if you started getting into the two and something, don't even bother, okay? It's just not worth it. Here's another Georgian casing. You can see that the proportions have just dropped down, that we still have this large back band, that we still have the three steps, still have the bead on the edge, but the proportion has dropped down. Now, where we're gonna see that is with our window. In the classical system, the two to one proportion is kind of a good proportion. This is not a huge window, right? <laughs> yeah, 31 by 62, right? So two to one. Then the next thing is, is that remember our pedestal, right? If I measure this pedestal height, we're looking at, you know, 25 inches to the top of there. I typically tell people that some of these pedestals are just getting too low uh, in that system. They don't work. You'll see them in classical buildings. You'll see them in historic things where they do. But really for modern buildings and things like that, we don't go that. I typically tell people between 28 and 32 inches. And so I've got, you know, 28 measured here. I got 32 measured there. Um, I'm probably just gonna set this at about 28, okay? And the reason why is because I'm comparing the two different heights here and where the height of this window is gonna end up um, versus this door. 
So I'm gonna set it up right at 32. Now we're gonna put our base molding. This is actually a Windsor base. And uh, that fits real nice. I really like it when it dies in behind the base like this and leaves a nice shadow line. That's really a great detail. Now we're basically in a simple bedroom, right? We're upstairs, but now we wanna move maybe to the entry hall or maybe to the downstairs space where people are and we need to elevate these moldings. How do you do that? Well, I wanna show you some cross-headed corners. We'll talk about a crown and we'll really kick this space up. So there, there's two ways historically to do this cross-headed corner. Probably the, the picture here of uh, the Charleston dining room shows this the pretty nature of this, this cross-headed corner where it breaks out around these, this outside, uh, almost as if there's a lintel that it's wrapping around, uh, but it's a real pretty detail. It's a real classical detail. The other way is shown at Philadelphia Hall where what's actually happening is they've got this little decorative element here but the, but the casing comes up, it's ripped a sections here, then the 45 comes here. So essentially it's kicked it out and then the casing runs across. Now, show you how that works. Basically here's our casing and I pre-cut these things, right? Here's that little sliver piece, right? And in order to get this right, we really need to create this little you know, square right here, which is this this same square. And it's not too hard to do really because all you're doing is you're just creating another couple miters. Then this one goes on here. Now our header comes across the top, right? So let me just cut that real quick. Now our header comes across the top and we've got our little cross headed corner really pretty, right? And it's a fun way of kind of mitering all these things around. And if you're so inclined to create that little decorative piece there, remember your door comes up this way, you've got a nice cross headed corner. Now, the other way to do it is inserting a block in here that kicks it out one inch, okay? Ish, maybe one inch and a half. And it really doesn't take much to really create this emphasis, it really doesn't require a lot of work in order to do this. In fact, this other kind of cross-headed corner where you're inserting this piece has to be made with a couple pieces of this casing, right? So I've already ripped down a piece of this casing on another piece. This is the result of that. So typically I like to uh, see the cross-headed corner drop down about a foot. And so somewhere in that way, if it's a bigger opening, maybe it drops down a little bit more. But in this case, we're gonna drop ours down a foot. In order to do that, right, we're building out this section here, we're pushing this away. To do that, I actually have to cut a 45 and I could do it on a table saw, a chop box. I don't wanna do that because of how this angle is gonna work. So I'm just gonna do it by hand. Now. So you could do it with a couple different things. I've got a Lee Nielsen back saw. I've got a Irwin Japanese saw. These are really nice saws to use as far as being able to use clean lines. And the reason I like using hand tools here is because of the precision I can get with these things versus a chop saw. And I'm just gonna go to the top of that, just right through this molding and then stop. The next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna rip this off. So this is where a table saw comes in really handy. So now I've got my block right on the back side. I've, I've made space for myself here so that it allow me to cut my 45 back, come back this way. I cut off a piece of the molding as you saw, and now I've mitered the top of it to accept this piece here, which goes right in there, which is what kicks us out the inch. And then 
my header will run right across here. So I'm gonna glue this piece on and sand and paint all this and we'll put this thing together just in a sec. Now, as you compare the two sides, you can see how you know elevated this is compared to that other side, how simple that is, and that by creating this cross-headed corner, it really improves this door, right? It elevates it. This is more appropriate for a downstairs room as opposed to this upstairs room. In fact, I think I'm just gonna cut this and just put this together real quick, show you how that looks. Okay, so we've elevated this space. We're no longer in the upstairs bedroom. We're now downstairs somewhere where we've elevated. What have we done? We've done the cross-headed corners. So we've got two types of cross-headed corners. Remember we made this, we, we have this one that kind of miters around, has a little bit more activity here. This one where we've added kind of a block inside here and pushed it over. This one, although it kicks out a little bit farther might be one of the reasons it looks heavier, but this would look really good on a massive entry, something that needs to be held up. This one is nice on this size door. You have to figure out what you want to do with that little square right there. You can also build a header over top of that. Remember this original piece that we did here? This one didn't have a cross-headed corner, but here's our architrave, here's our architrave, okay? Here's our freeze. This one's pulvinated. It's kind of proud. And then here's our cornice, right? So if you want, you can elevate this again by putting a door header over top of it. We've, we've elevated this door then three ways. We've done it with just straight casing, the size of the casing. We've now introduced the cross headed corners. And then if you want to go an extra step, you could do the door header. So a lot of fun things to you do, a lot of dialing around here that you can have fun with. Now, I also did this chair rail and I didn't have a great chair rail and so I wanted to make one. Now, if you begin to look at this, here's our chair rail, right? Here's our chair rail. This one's a little lower, about 25. This one's at 28 and I established this with the windowsill and I bumped out that windowsill just a little bit to give it a little bit more oomph. So what I did was I just took a, a beaded casing and then I added this back band. What I want you guys to get good at is finding and picking moldings and using them together to make things, right? Because if you remember the ICAA sheet on the palette of moldings. It's really just a collection of shapes and details, fillets and flat places and, and uh, cavettos and cymorectas. All those different things can be used to make something. So what I did was I started with that little beaded casing at the bottom and I added this little back band. This is from Windsor. This is their back band for the classical colonial si series. And so you can take and pick and choose these parts and really build different things. And then, you know, the last thing is I stuck a plinth block in here, right? And people often, often ask on the plinth block, how do you know which size it is? How do you know how tall it is? Typically in the Georgian period, the plinth block was the same height as the base, okay? And that's what we're trying to show there. In the federal era, they end up getting a little bit taller and they might catch this base too. I've got just a square piece of wood and there's good historic precedent for that. Sometimes you'll see it where it's, where it's tapered down so it's not quite as blocky. In the Victorian period, as you may remember from some of my videos, it gets real tall and it actually has a decorative face. And so there's all kinds of different ways to play with the parts and pieces and one by one, adding the chair rail. You know, if I wanted to elevate it again, I could put paneling here. I could put paneling above. And so all of a sudden I'm, I'm building out and one by one, piece by piece, I'm kind of dialing up this room so that it's nicer, right? It's elevated. Now, last thing is, is crown. And we're gonna talk about how to elevate and use different crowns that all speak to one another, yet are different. Remember in this whole classical system, and I was just talking about that dial that you add things and you subtract things. And so, you know, if we have this, you know, the section of our room, the simplest is just a base molding and a crown. Then you introduce a chair rail. Then you begin to introduce a wainscot, right? A panel wainscot. Then you actually have a panel here, maybe another panel here, or maybe you introduce a lot more crown details. If we're gonna focus on the crown, there's kind of three different ways to do that. The most elevated would be to do the full entablature, right? So that's everything above the column that we've talked about. So in, this, in that case, it would be your crown, your corona, drip edge, you've got your bed mold right here, 
you've got your freeze, and then you've got your architrave. Your column is right here. So this whole thing is your architrave, and you've got your cornice, your freeze, and your architrave. And all of this is the entablature. Because we've got a 10-foot room here, we've actually got room over top of this door to do the full entablature. And if we went to our reference piece, we would see that the full entablature is about 19 inches, right? So we could come down 19 inches on this on this deal fairly easily, right? It would get it down to here, okay? What ends up happening is when you do that, it gets really heavy. It's rare, except in very elevated rooms, like uh, state houses and, and kind of public spaces and things like that, where you'd see this full entablature. What's oftentimes done is they'll stop, and this is called the tania, okay? This is the top of the architrave. And if we just took that measurement here, if we just did those parts and pieces, we're down to about 15 inches, right? So we've cut off about four inches. And that, all of a sudden, looks in this room much better because it comes down to about here. Think about, uh, again, it's a pretty elevated detail to do this cornice and this frieze with this little tinea. Um, There's a lot of moldings. And so, depending on the house you're building, right? If it's, if it's a cottage, you wouldn't be doing any of this stuff. But you need to be able to step down different moldings. And so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually do this. We're gonna do this for the nicest area. Okay, I'm gonna show you how to do that. And then for secondary areas, you can just do the cornice. Or you're just gonna do this, this four-part moldings. I'll show you those different moldings. Both Cucan and Windsor have those. And then for upstairs, you might go with the crown and then introduce that beaded casing again. So that you might come down, I don't know, five, six inches. But in those bedrooms, depending on how elevated the rest of your house is, you may need that. You may All you may, may need is just that crown. Some rooms, and in very simple houses, you wouldn't even have that. You're gonna be playing around with, when you're putting together moldings for your house, what belongs, what's appropriate, and then how to put them in. So if we're building a crown and a simple crown, I talked about the readability of the molding. What I'm doing here is, is I'm gonna set just a regular crown, okay, on a beady casing. So I have a little bit of a finish. I'm not gonna put this molding right there because these are so close together, you can no longer read them. I'm gonna spread this out here so they have a really pretty Sima and then this break, and then this finishes with the bead. That's how we're gonna treat the simple. Now remember, you can just use a straight crown, but if you wanted to elevate it a little bit, then you do this. This is the first one I'm gonna nail up. And there is our simple crown. The next one, we're gonna elevate quite a bit. Let me show you how that, that works. So remember, we've got the cornice, the frieze, and then the architrave, right? So if we're gonna build this full, okay, there's our, there's our, uh, our architrave, okay? We could pretend that this is our, our frieze, right? And then we're gonna build our cornice. Now, I like the cornice as a four-part crown. The, the cornice is made up of four parts. You have a corona, bed mold, and a Simon, Simon's the crown, okay? What you're seeing me do here, and, and what both Cucan and Windsor have done, is they built me and, and provided with a proper drip edge. This was introduced and put onto stone buildings and stuff so that water coming down here would drip off and not run down the face. Now, you've got two, you've got a cymation, which goes to the top and a bed mold. And essentially, moldings are supposed to be supportive. They're supposed to have purpose, okay? One thing is you have supporting moldings, moldings that lift up, and then you have finishing moldings or terminating moldings that finish. And so, supporting moldings are like this, okay? So that this line comes up here and it supports, it lifts up. This is a terminating molding because there's not any support here and it's a termination. It's a ta-da. If I put those on here, the bed mold goes underneath because it's supporting. It goes underneath the cornice. My crown is supported by this supporting molding. See that? This uh, molding supports and lifts up this because I still have a cymation, the crown on top of this. There. So coming down about seven or eight inches underneath this 10 foot line. 
which is about, right, that cornice size on our reference piece. I'm just gonna eyeball this. Now we're gonna take our cornice and put it up there. So now what we've got is two cornices, right? One's very simple, kind of a, a simpler arrangement here, bedroom. Something now that's, that's much more built up and more elaborate in a downstairs area where we have the cross-headed corners. So guys, we've played with the Georgian style today. We, we kind of fitted a room out, right? We played with a, a 10 foot tall room and we play with hierarchy. We, we play with a lot of different moldings and details so that we could end up with a bunch of different things. Having this reference piece here helps us realize the sizes of moldings and how they come together. Hopefully, you now realize that you do not need to use two inch, three inch moldings because we really need to punctuate the openings. Hopefully, you realize now there's a couple different ways to cross set your corners on your things to elevate your room. Now adding a wainscot, right? Adding a chair rail. All these things elevate and enhance the beauty of your building and your design. So be sure to follow me on uh, Instagram, Whole Millwork Hull Homes. Also on Facebook, Whole Millwork. We also have a newsletter on the Build Show. Uh, be sure to sign up for that newsletter because every week we have people, we have new videos that are coming out. So I've got a lot of videos on that Build Show. You need to check them out. If you haven't seen the classical one, you really should start there. There's a two-part classical teaser on you know how this system works, why it's beautiful, and how to build better houses. So I'm Brent Hall. Thanks for watching.